Welcome, folks, to another special off-season edition, episode number 28 of the No Conference for Old Men podcast today. It's been a little while since we've had an episode, so apologies to our loyal listeners. But with Hurricane Barrel coming through Houston and then two potential guests falling through the cracks, given the storm's aftermath, We decided to give it a rest and skip the July episode while everyone tried to get back to normalcy before publishing another episode. No special guests this episode, but we'll have two of the three old guys today with Bill Walker and myself, Steve Chang, and a topic-packed episode that I think folks will enjoy. So with the 2025 recruiting official visits and potential commitments hitting its peak period, we're going to kick things off with a men's basketball recruiting segment providing a little bit of player evaluation insights into the kids that the Cougars are actively in play for. We'll then pivot to discuss our initial impressions of Eni Nunez, our new athletics director replacing Chris Pesman, and then close the episode with our reaction to the recent rumors of the Big 12 flirting yet again with UConn to join the Big 12 conference. So let's start off with the recruiting topic here, Bill. With our Cougars completing our initial season in the Big 12 with a bang, winning the conference outright, landing a number one seed in the tourney, making another Sweet 16, and really being just a Jamal Shed injury away from advancing further, we are in line to potentially sign our greatest recruiting class ever for 2025. We've got kids like Isaiah Harwell, Braden Burries, Shelton Henderson, Koa Pete, John Clark, Chris Sinak, and Kingston Flemings as reportedly our primary targets. All are four or five stars across the various publications, and to make the most use of time, let's really discuss them by position groups. And then we'll close the segment with who each of us hope from that group will end up signing. And so starting off with the wings, maybe if you can give your impressions of Harwell and then Burries, and then I'll do the same. Gotcha. Well, in terms of Harwell, ESPN has him as as the 13th best player in the country, five star, the number two rated shooting guard in the country. And, And I think that's, from what I've seen, that's pretty much across the board. He's from Idaho and he's 6'6", 200 pounds. I mean, a a pro size shooting guard and, and everything I've seen and heard has been phenomenal. He does everything. He's got a great all-around game. He defends, and it looks to me when we get to everyone on here that they all defend, which yeah, you know, it's great for guys. Every one of these guys is in ESPN's top fifty, and it certainly is going to bode well f- for potentially playing for Kelvin. Yeah. So we've got that. Harwell, the last I heard, and you may have an update on this, Steve, but the last I heard it was U of H and, and Texas were toward the top, although Gonzaga was right Gonzaga. there. Yep. And Cal Berkeley. But uh yeah, I mean Harwell would be phenomenal. You know, once again, a a six six two guard who could shoot. You know, shooting's been one of the areas where we've struggled from time to time and, and a guy that's just got a pure shot, but can do everything else. He can yeah. handle the ball. He can rebound. He defends. He, I mean, he's the entire package and yeah, it would be great to have him. You know, Burries is uh is the number two rated shooting guard just ahead of Harwell. Whereas Harwell's number 13 in ESPN's top 100 Burries is number 11, so so they're right there. He's from Riverside, California, 6'4", 185, so a little bit smaller, but still a you know great size for a two-guard. The last I heard, and, and Steve, you'll probably have an update on this, U of H was right there, but so were a ton of other schools at this point. I, I haven't seen much narrowed down. Alabama, Arizona, Arizona State, Cal, yeah. Duke, Illinois, Kansas, Minnesota, San Diego State, St. John, Stanford, TCU, UCLA, USC, and Washington <laughs> State. So pretty much every yeah. good big school is after Burry's. Uh yeah, he's he's uh like I said, he's a little bit smaller, but the thing about him that I really like is that he could play the 
point guard or the two. Sure. He can guard probably three positions, the the one, the two, or the three, a point guard, two guard, or a small forward. He can shoot. He's a really good rebounder. He defends. He probably defends better than Harwell does, although they're both good defensive players. And, uh, you know, Burry's just has everything, and, uh, and that's why everyone wants him. But we're right up at the top of the list. So, yeah, I mean, the, the number two and the number three. I know rated shooting guards and it's coming down to the wire and we're right there for both of them is great yeah it's crazy the the types of talent that we're now recruiting i mean it's really jumped up yet another level in harwell looking at harwell he visited this past weekend he's a big wing like you said six foot six 200 pounds roughly with a beautiful all-around game he can shoot the three, like you said, take it to the hoop with great athleticism, can handle the rock and distribute with ease. He's, he's got a really mature game. There's a smooth, effortless way about his game. Very obvious why he's a consensus five-star. Beyond the ESPN ranking, he's number 10 by 24-7, and then number eight by on three. He is actually the best player I've seen us recruit during Samson's time, and his game kind of reminds me a little bit of Grant Hill's game. All around can do everything, very unselfish. Burries, as you'd highlight, also another big wing, six foot four, roughly 185, 195. Also a beautiful all around game. He's got a beautiful, beautiful shot and seems to rely on the three a lot more than Harwell when it comes to scoring. He can also take it to the hoop and just finds the creases to score. I would say he's a little bit less explosive than Harwell can also handle the rock extremely well for his size. Did not see much distribution, even though I know they've listed him as a combo guard. But boy, he's super effective hunting the threes. When I watch him play, he kind of reminds me of a Clay Thompson, Devin Booker type of player. Very obvious why he's a five slash four star. I think he's number 11 in 24-7 and number 12 in on three. Love both of their games. Uh, If I had to choose, I'd probably pick Harwell. Now, jumping over to, I'll call it maybe not the four slot, but a forward slot. And I've grouped both Shelton Henderson and Koa Pete in this grouping. What are your impressions of both players? Well, Pete's the number four ranked player in, in ESPN. He's He would be, from a ranking standpoint, he, he would be the... You know, he, he's like Highest, yeah. bringing in Jairus Walker. Yeah. He's exceptional. Now, from what I've heard, and, and you and I have talked about this, we may not be right at or, you know, atop his priority list anymore. So I'm, yeah. I'll defer to you on him. <laughs> Henderson, Henderson's got kind of two guard size he's you know six yeah. five but but he's about 225 i mean he's yeah. uh, he's got an nba build right now he does i mean he is a strong player he's number 46 he's he's the lowest rated i mean this is incredible he's the <laughs> lowest rated player that we're recruiting i mean yeah. what you know what have you ever said that about u of h in the past we're you know we're talking about seven players here the worst ranked of them is at number 46. I mean, that, that's just nuts. Just yeah. extraordinary. The last I saw, he was looking at U of H, Duke, Louisville, LSU, Texas, and, and Tech. Uh, he's from Bel Air. He's, he's yeah. from right here in Houston. This guy is, I'd say of everyone on the list, this guy should be at U of H. He is a Calvin Sampson guy. Yeah. He guards multiple positions. He, Like I said, he's got an NBA frame. He gets to the basket. He draws a, an inordinate number of fouls uh, offensively. Yeah. He's, he's extremely physical. He, he can just do everything. He can do everything defensively, rebounding. You, you know, the, the offensive skill set is certainly not at Burry's or Harwell's level. But like I said, He's adept at putting the ball on the on the floor, getting to the free throw line, and, and and creating offense. And yeah, this this guy to me is of everyone on the list. He is a U of H guy. Yeah, I would agree. 
Well, for me, when I look at the two, I, I agree. Henderson, I think most folks consider him a small forward, but I'm categorizing as more of a four given his size, strength, as you had mentioned, and style of play. His scoring is all inside with dunks, three-foot shots, plays with great, great physicality, and just bullies high school kids inside with his strength and athleticism. Has got great handles and passing for a kid that size, but doesn't shoot well enough to play the three, in my opinion. He's a consensus four-star, number 18 by 24-7 and number 31 by on three. We were favorite for him for a while, heavy, heavy favorites, but that since has cooled down a little bit with the Duke offer. But we're still in it. His game reminds me of a former Dukey, Justice Winslow, Ricky Winslow's son from Houston days. So very athletic, very physical, Mm -hmm. would be an ideal fit for us. Pete is more of a traditional four at 6'8", 230. Also a very physical player, plays inside with lots of short five-foot shots and dunks. Didn't see him handle the ball much, but he's a good passer from the post. Moves well without the ball and nice touch inside. Much more polished with his game than Henderson. But I feel like when I watch him play, his motor doesn't always run hot and he'll coast at times. He's a consensus five-star, the highest rated of any of the players we're recruiting at number five by 24-7 and number nine on, on three. Game reminds me a little bit of P.J. Washington from Kentucky and, and now with the Mavs. We were in on him early in this cycle, and though we're still on his list, it looks like it's going to be one of the Arizona schools that's going to sign him, and, and that's where he's from. Now, as we start covering what I consider the two most important positions, uh, let's go to the center slot and talk about John Clark and Chris Senak. Okay. Uh, well, if we start with Clark, he's a six eight center, college that's plenty big enough, 235. Uh, he's number 34 on, on ESPN's list. The most updated uh, list that I've seen has, obviously, U of H, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, yep. and Ohio State. Cl- Clark is uh, he's a phenomenal athlete for, for his size, a really good athlete. He could pass for his size. He could, he could shoot reasonably well for his size. He could put the ball on the floor. He also is a turnover machine. He, he <laughs> kind of wants to to make ESPN's uh, you know top ten at the end of the show, and and, <laughs> and he definitely looks for the highlight play, the spectacular dunk, uh, yeah. and he creates a lot of turnovers. He just you know for his size, he is a great athlete. He blocks shots. Yeah. He protects the rim. Of all the people on the list, he seems the furthest from a typical Calvin player to me. Really? But okay. Then again, you know, if he if he buys in, that's a huge factor. And 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 if he buys in, then he'll become a team player for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I see him as at least just on paper being the, you know, maybe the least of the Kelvin type players, but obviously, you know, that that's not taking what he thinks into, into consideration. And, you know, we'll see. Senak is right there with Pete. He's number six on ESPN's list, 6'10", 230, you know, big guys from New Orleans. Yeah. I've seen a, a big list, uh, U of H, Alabama, Auburn, Baylor, Kentucky, Louisville, LSU, Michigan State, Tennessee, Texas, and UConn. At one point, I heard that it may be down to LSU and U of H. Yep. We'll see if, if any of the others step up. But yeah, he's quite honestly, even though he's 6'10", you know, big guy, I think he's more of a, of a power forward. This guy I see like Henderson, an absolute Calvin guy. He didn't play when he was younger, and he's absolutely, for lack of a better term, he's busted his ass. He's he is a hard worker. He, I mean, he's worked his butt off to develop his game, his inside presence, his his even his perimeter game. Uh, he he could shoot 
semi well for for his size. He's someone that just is going to do whatever it takes to ultimately get himself to the NBA and to make whatever school he attends, hopefully U of H, as successful as possible. But he will almost assuredly be the hardest worker of anyone on the team if uh, if Calvin brings him in. Nice. Yeah, looking at these two kids, Clark's the one that really blew up last summer. Listed, at least what I saw listed, was 6'9", 210. But I think you're much more accurate. He definitely looks bigger, heavier than that, probably close to the 230, 235 range. He was on the same AAU team with a much heralded Robert Miller last summer. And at that time, you know, we were also recruiting that kid who ended up at LSU. But watching that team, it was actually Clark that was jumping off the screen for me with his physicality and effort. His ranking has actually cooled a little bit this summer, but I'm still a big fan. Consensus four-star. He's number 54 by 24-7 and then number 43 by on three. He's not the most explosive guy, but what I love most about Clark is his motor. He plays with a relentless effort and actually reminds me a little bit of a young Moses Malone playing inside. Now, Cenac, he's one that blew up big time this summer. And he was not a kid I was familiar with or followed much of before now. I see some listings have him at 6'10 and only 2'10 with long arms, great athleticism. There's lots to love about his game and potential. Not the strongest uh, center, but still he's able to find the creases to score inside and finish off rim running dunks. Exceptionally good ball handler and passing skills for his size. Reminds me a little bit of Jared Allen from Texas and now the Cavs, who Samson had recruited back uh, when he was uh, a senior in high school. He's a consensus five-star now, and everyone's on him. He's number 14 on 24-7 and number five on on three. I didn't think we had much of a chance with CNAC after he blew up in. Leading up to this weekend, it was thought that LSU had him wrapped up, but he's coming in. For his official visit this weekend with the Cougs. And then some prognosticators actually are now claiming that we're the favorite ones. And so fingers crossed that he has a great weekend here. And finally, let's talk about Kingston Flemings as the lone prospect that we are recruiting at the all important point guard position. What are your thoughts on him, Bill? Yeah, he, he's, he's out of San Antonio. He's the number four rated point guard that I saw at number 23 on ESPN's list, 6'3", 170, so good size for a point guard. He's a little bit of a latecomer. Yeah. I've seen the list narrowed down to U of H, Texas, UT, Tech, and Gonzaga. So those are the four that I see being the, the top contenders. And, and once again, he's from San Antonio, so yep. hopefully we can bring him here. He's an extraordinarily an extraordinary ball handler. Uh, he, he's just a great all around athlete. He can do pretty much everything. Yeah. You know, he he's going to be a guy that you, you know can get up and, and block shots, create steals, much like Shed did. And please, I'm not I'm not <laughs> complaining to Jamal Shed, but he's got a phenomenal skill set. He's a guy that. He'll defend. He plays hard. I'd see him being a great addition. Yeah, I completely agree. Flemings is my favorite player in this entire class. And as you'd highlighted, the San Antonio kid, and I have followed him for two years. He blew up two summers ago as well when John Clark was blowing up. 6'3", only 170, but super quick and explosive. He is a true point guard like we haven't had here in Houston since I followed the team back in the 80s. Just given his size and and skill set, just a very different kind of a point guard. Handles the ball like the ball's on a string. Explosive first step to get by anyone. And a consummate team facilitator with the ball, but with the explosiveness to finish at the rim whenever he wants to. He's a consensus four-star, number 21 in 24-7, and number 13 on three. But quite honestly, he should be a five-star. He's representing the U.S. this weekend in 
It's an international three on three tournament. And his game is reminiscent of a younger Derek Rose and John Wall when they were in college. Just, um, I don't think anyone can contain him. He's so quick. And so that's it for the kids that we know that we're after. And Bill, if you had your druthers you know, out of this group, what kind of a class would be ideal in your mind? What guys would you want? All of them. <laughs> and, you know, uh, and, and the A, that's unrealistic, and yeah. B, as we earlier discussed off air, yeah, you don't necessarily want to be the University of Kentucky, although yeah. uh, they, they did win some titles. So, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, Flemings, I would love to have Flemings. I would yeah. love to have CNAC. I mean, it's yeah. you know, it's basically us and, and LSU. I'd love to have CNAC. I'd love to have Flemings. I'd love the Bel Air kid, Shelton Henderson. Yeah. I just, I just think he's ready made for U of H. And then it comes down to the two guards. And I mean, I, I love both two guards. But uh, yeah, I, I may agree with you. Even though he's the number three and Burries is the number two, I, I might take Harwell over Burries. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm still going with, you know. <laughs> Yep. Four incoming players, all just exceptional and all different positions. And uh, yeah, I, I don't think anyone would be the least bit disappointed. I, I think we would have the one or two, no worse than third best recruiting class in the nation. Yeah, I, I think you're you're absolutely right. And it it's interesting because we didn't talk about this before coming on air in terms of naming the the kids that we would want. And you're going to see a lot of similarities here. I think we signed three in this class since I just don't believe coach likes to have, you know, too young of a roster, but who knows, right? With this level of talent of a group that we're after, maybe he takes four or, or even more. I tend to have a bias towards Houston and Texas kids, and that would include Henderson, Clark, and Flemings in this group. But if I'm being totally impartial and looking at their games and fit to the Houston program. My ideal class would include Flemings from the point guard position, Harwell from the, the guard position, Senac at the five. And if he's going to take a fourth, I take Henderson as well. Like you said, he's a perfect fit for our program. And yeah, you want to talk about a fab four, that would be a fab four where it'd be really tough to keep any of these kids out of the uh, the starting lineup, or at least playing significant minutes in year one. The the other thing to consider, Steve, is that you know you got to look at at the current U of H roster. Absolutely, we're losing Cryer, we're losing Wilson. Sharp is a junior. Uh, my guess is that that he'd be back, but you know you never know. Ramon's a senior. Yep. Ars every year there's talk of Arsenault. Yep being a pro, rated right? yeah. you know th- at least at least up there in the rankings so if he's if he's injury free and has a good year i mean he you know he could go yep i mean tugler could easily just explode yep. and be gone juan is certainly playing yep. his he's final gone. year you know francis is a senior so we're losing some players this we year are. and and we're gonna have to bring some in so if we were to bring in those four kids, uh, I mean, th- that would be just exceptional. Yeah, absolutely. Now, next, let's talk about the recent announcement of Eni Nunez as our new VP of Athletics slash Athletics Director. We were all fortunate enough to have our former AD, Chris Pesman, on our show during this past basketball season. And though he's one of our own and he was super gracious in being on our podcast With the changing landscape of college athletics and our entry into the Big 12, President Katora felt like there was a need for change and some new ideas. Eddie comes to us from University of New Mexico, where he had to clean up quite the financial mess. And previous to New Mexico, he had a long stint at LSU, having had the opportunity to play multiple roles during that time in one of the biggest athletic departments in D1. So what do you think? Bill, around the the hire. And I know, you know, truth be told, right, you knew Chris quite well. You're the one that got him onto our podcast. But what are your thoughts around the hire? Yeah. Yeah. I, I honestly, I, I don't know Eddie 
uh, or about Eddie all that well. I mean, he, you know, during his his time at New Mexico, he, he's kind of brought the basketball team back to to a competitive level. I mean, they they won the conference last year. He hired young Rick Pitino, yeah, and you know, good move there. Football there has been pretty abysmal, yeah, throughout the the entire tenure. Uh, pulling Bronco Mendenhall out of retirement was, I think, a a very nice hire. Yep, and uh, uh, so clearly he can get some people that can help turn programs around from a coaching standpoint. In you know, I've heard some good things about things like game day experience and some other areas. But quite honestly, what I what I'd like to do, especially with a lot of what I've seen recently, is address the former athletic director Chris Pesman. Yeah, I, I still don't understand letting him go. And and uh, you know, there may well not there may I'm sure there are people that that disagree with me. But I mean, yeah, I, I'm frustrated over that move. You know, Chris, number one, the U of H grad. Number two, Chris loves U of H. I mean, loves U of H. He, he is constantly promoting the athletic department, uh, supporting it, raising money. He's a tireless worker. And, and I've, you know, I get some information that, that you know, I, I don't post it or anything, but, but I've heard on extremely good authority that after he was fired, there were a lot of eight figure donors not a, not a lot but but the eight figure donors uh, almost to a man that were going to pull support financial support for U of H athletics back and who was it that reached out to them and and ended up getting them to sign their names on the on the checks it, it was the recently deposed Chris Pesman. And, and that just shows how, how, you know, how he feels about U of H, what, what he's done for U of H, he, what he continues to do for U of H. I mean, it's he, just the, the consummate U of H person. You know, are there any other athletic directors that, that you could think of or name who have raised $94 million, which is what he, he, he was uh, responsible for raising for the football stadium. And and the, the answer is none. He hired Willie Fritz, whose hiring has been almost universally lauded. He was right there renewing Calvin's contract and keeping Calvin at U of H. He, he was at the helm uh, when we made our move into the into the Big Twelve, and, and right now it just it, it well he came on our podcast, but he he came on. Because he was tirelessly promoting U of H athletics at every opportunity, and, and I mean, he, he, you know, I just can't imagine a, a a better athletic department and a better athletic director leading that department. Yeah, it, it seems like there's a bit of a smear campaign taking place right now with you know Chris not well being accused of not doing enough. You know, for the for the athletic department and, and being strictly a uh, kind of a facilities guy, and and I don't know. I, I my, my question, if if someone from the administration was in front of me right now, would 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 be to say, how many things did did Chris try try to get done that that were blocked? I, I just I don't understand a lot of the 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 negativity right now, and and uh, and. Yes, I, I, I'm frustrated as hell that that Chris was fired. I, I think it was it was not the right decision. I, I think if if there was a U of H guy and, and someone that was going to continue to lead U of H into into prominence in the Big Twelve, it was absolutely Chris. Saying that and and being as unhappy as I am with the decision, I, I'm don't get me wrong. I'm still a hundred percent behind U of H. I'm a hundred percent behind Eddie Nunez. Behind the athletic department, 100 percent will continue to support it at every turn. Uh, I just, yeah, very frustrated over it. Well, I mean, obviously, I, I didn't have the relationship that you had with Chris. Things weren't completely rosy either. Otherwise, you know, the step wouldn't have occurred. The department had its challenges from a 
raising money perspective, we're, if not the most subsidized athletic department in P4, we're certainly in the top three most subsidized at this point. I think we also recently saw the bridge loan from the academic side of another 10 million for athletics, just so we can get through this year. And, you know, as was cited by the, the press, as well as Dr. Couture, trying to raise money is kind of the, the key piece of it. And even with the 94 million, we're still in the hole in a big way. And, and we had some other challenges that I'm not going to get into around the athletics department, right? Again, we can go back and forth around that, that perspective and kind of whose responsibility it is to kind of change the paradigm and, and try to take advantage of the opportunities within the fourth largest city in terms of from a funding perspective. I mean, President Couture referenced the need for fresh ideas around raising money, as well as a more experienced hand moving forward. So I'll admit that I started thinking more towards an out-of-the-box hire versus any retreads or existing ADs. And of the names we heard, I was most excited at the time about the supposed other finalist, Ryan Alpert. He was deputy AD at Tennessee, who had been credited with finding creative ways to generate new revenue and was the driving force around their build out of a whole entertainment district around their football stadium at Tennessee. But I think, and I'm just pontificating here, but I think what it boiled down to during the offer time was perhaps his lack of experience running the whole department. And that really rendered Nunez as potentially a a safer hire since he'd done that already at, at New Mexico. We'll never know. But, you know, at this point, we all have to support Nunez, his experience across different roles at Florida and his basketball background, walking on there for Donovan, hopefully means continued strong support and attention for our hoops program. So I'm excited and I'm all in with Nunez and hopefully all the alumni stand up to support his efforts moving forward because we only have this one opportunity to set things up properly before more changes come, right, as it relates to things like realignment, NIL, and things of that nature. And finally, let's maybe talk about the recent news leaks in the last few days around UConn again having talks with the Big 12 about joining the conference. There's a lot of noise prior to the PAC schools joining around UConn and Commissioner Yormark has not been shy about voicing his view that college basketball is highly undervalued and potentially wanting to take the TV rights out to market uncoupled with football in the future. He's also been leaning in heavily on the Big 12 being the number one conference in hoops and wanting to build on top of that. UConn would obviously achieve that in not only reinforcing the Big 12 being number one, but taking it further by becoming the dominant force come tourney time, national championships, and NCAA dollar credits moving forward. So what's your perspective on the potential of UConn joining the Big 12? Yeah, you've pretty much hit every point, Steve. I'll I'll just say, number one, it's not obviously, it's not New York, it's not... uh, you know, Boston, Philadelphia, but, but it is the Northeast and UConn is heavily, heavily followed in the entire Northeast due to their success. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I like adding them from that perspective. I like the fact that we would probably, not that we'd play them every year, but we've got another, uh, a football win <laughs> <laughs> on, on the slate. And, uh, you know, right now it's, it's going to be tough from a football standpoint early on. And and I'm 100% behind Coach Fritz and what he's going to do. But early on, it's going to be tough. Yeah. So if UConn joins and, and we can get them on the schedule, <laughs> perfect. But, I mean, it makes us absolutely the preeminent by, in my opinion, a, quite a bit. Yeah. The preeminent basketball conference in the country. And, you know, U of H – it stays in the top, you know, one, two, three, the ratings are going to justify our, our number one, number two seeds on a year in and year in out basis. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't especially see the downside in adding Connecticut. I mean, I've been an advocate for UConn joining, especially in basketball. I know football is king and drives the TV dollars, but I'm 110% in with Commissioner Yormark in building 
on our strength in positioning the Big 12 to become the dominant number one conference in basketball. And, you know, quite honestly, bridging the money gap that way when you're comparing yourselves to the SEC and Big 10, because you can't expect to catch up trying to do the exact same things that they're doing. And we need to lean in on our strengths and hoops is the way to achieve that. I also believe that UConn is just step one in anticipation of the ACC falling apart. I do not believe we're going to end up getting schools like FSU, Clemson, or North Carolina, or Virginia, if that actually occurs. However, I do believe that we can let the SEC and Big 12 fight over those teams but still come up with some incredible additions in schools like Miami, Virginia Tech, and Duke to strengthen both football and basketball to get to 20. And I'm going to go on a crazy limb at this point even further in stating that I believe your mark's endgame is 24 teams total in the Big 12. And that would include four non-football members in schools like Gonzaga, Villanova, St. John's, and Georgetown before the 2031 contract negotiations take place. And he takes basketball out on its own for its separate deal. He'll need enough inventory to attract game-changing dollars split across ESPN, Fox, and I think he's also going to target Turner and Amazon, while both the remnants in the ACC and the Big East become non-existent with those moves. And you achieve this strength in hoops without sacrificing your football programs. And that's the way we end up staying relevant and bridge the gap versus the SEC and Big 12. I know it's a lot of speculation on my part, but I love this stuff. (laughs) I'm one of those uh, individuals that can't get enough of this realignment and the business side of college sports. And I think it's critically important at this point to ensure that U of H stays at the big boys table moving forward. We got to think outside the box. So that's it for this episode 28 of the No Conference for Old Men podcast. Hope you all enjoyed it. And again, would really appreciate it if folks would follow, subscribe, or collect our podcast, depending on your podcast platform of choice. We are also available via the Republic of Football podcast feed from the folks at Dave Campbell's Texas Football as the only basketball-centric podcast We're at gokus.com website for those that prefer to digest the content that way. We appreciate the continued support from all. Also, please give us a follow on our Twitter account, No Conference for Old Men. We will be doing one more off-season episode in September, and then we will be finally back with our weekly cadence heading into the season. So I cannot wait. Please be on the lookout to download and listen as the next episode drops next month. Take care, everyone and talk to you soon.